Hi, Misha here. And it's time to get to the very famous and very widely produced General Dynamics, later Lockheed Martin F-16 Falcon or Fighting Falcon. And I have three models of Hobby Masters on the table. This is just going to be an overview video. I will do more videos getting into specifics, but just felt like doing an overview today. On the left here, I have a former Belgian F-16A Block 20 that was entered into Jordan World Purchase by the Jordanian government, Air Force and given a midlife upgrade in 2014. Then I have a slightly older one. This is an F-16 AM, which was originally a Block 15 and then upgraded, used by NASA. And then finally I have the newest variant This is a Polish Air Force F-16D Block 52, and this is a two-seater. It's the most modern of the three. I can make an hour-long video about the history and development of the F-16. I don't think either of us want that right now, so I'll probably break this up. Just to give a brief history, this really dates back to the 1950s and 60s and the formation of the so-called fighter mafia within the United States Air Force that lobbied for a new, at that time, daytime, lightweight fighter and pretty much got what it wanted. At least the committee was established and it gained traction in 1969 through 1971 when lessons from the Vietnam War and the F-4 Phantom were apparent by 1960, excuse me, 1972 the uh, lightweight fighter program was up and running it was more of a design study than anything else in the beginning however five companies would submit potential designs and of those it was kind of down selected to General Dynamics they would produce the YF-16 and Northrop which would produce the YF-17 and both were asked to submit two prototypes in 1972 and by the end of 1973 General Dynamics would have a rollout first kind of unveiling of its YF-16 prototype. The first test flight of this plane was unintentional in January 20th, 1974. It was a high-speed runway taxi test and then the plane, one of its underfins, clipped the runway and instead of potentially rolling it over and doing damage the pilot took off, was airborne for six, seven minutes, and then landed. The first official test flight, scheduled flight, was on February 2nd, and it's a testament to the design early on that even though it suffered minor damage during the unintentional, unintentional flight, it was easily repaired and the schedule was kept. Then it was tested supersonic just a few days later, and then in May of that year, the second prototype first flew. As for Northrop and its YF-17, its prototype was first ready in June of that year and would fly a short time later. It was really at this time that American allies such as Belgium, Norway, the Netherlands, and a few others took note. They had been using older F-104 Starfighters. And they said, look, you know, if, if you make a few changes, 
and if you select this lightweight fighter, we're, we're very amenable to adopting it, buying it ourselves. This would essentially turn into a slightly new program. Originally, the lightweight fighter was to be a daytime fighter interceptor, about 20,000 pounds, capable of fighting between about Mach 0.6 and 1.6 at altitudes between 30,000 and 40,000 feet, which is kind of what they determined were the, the most common ones. It was kind of a counterpart to the F-15, which I have done a video on. The F-15 was the big high-performance aircraft. Well, the F-16 was to be essentially, or I should say the lightweight fighter, was basically to be the less expensive counterpart, something that, they, that the Air Force could afford to buy many more of. And, uh, yeah. And there was some early controversy, but essentially the, the F-15 guys were soothed and uh, yeah about 74 75 things are going better well this would be rolled into a new program the advanced combat fighter which was a multi-role fighter capable of being a bomber and, and fulfilling other things this is what the Europeans became very interested in so on and so forth then in January of 1975, the Air Force announced that the YF-16 was the winner. It was kind of a hands-down winner. It, um, it was just well-liked by pilots. It was more maneuverable, more agile than the YF-17. That's not to say the YF-17 did not have attributes. Far from it. In fact, it would later have success. It's a little-known plane. It's called the F-A-18 Hornet. You may not have heard of it. But yeah, don't feel bad for Northrop. Their design was far from a dead end. But for what the Air Force wanted and its allies in Europe, it was uh, General Dynamics YF-16, later to be just F-16, that fit the bill. So it was selected in January. And initial kind of pre-production was underway by the end of that year. It was named the Fighting Falcon, officially, but unofficially, it was well known as the Viper. So what exactly did the Air Force end up adopting? Well, the F-16 was originally quite lightweight. The initial version started off at about 18,000 pounds. Of course, over time, it would uh, gain some weight as it reached middle age. It happens. It was just under 50 foot long and had a wingspan of just under 33 feet. So actually relatively small for a fighter from its era. It was capable of reaching Mach 2. Had a maximum altitude of around 50,000 feet. It came standard with one 20 millimeter M61A1 cannon which with over 500 rounds of ammunition. It had a total of 11 hard points. It had the two wingtip rails. And then you have three points under each wing. And then you have a center line hard point. And then you have two chin rails or points really used for sensors like the lantern pod which wouldn't come to later of course the initial pre-production would start up like I said in late 75 and um, in 1976 they would have the first models ready to go the 
first single seat pre-production would fly in December of that year. They would build eight with two pre-production two-seaters. 77 they would ramp up production and by late 78 the first true production model FA excuse me F16A would fly followed shortly by the F16B 2C the Air Force would take delivery of its first planes in January of 1979 and by 1980, the name Fighting Falcon, after the Air Force mascot, would be officially given. And it would enter into U.S. Air Force Squadron service that year. And the Europeans, true to their word, would um, not only adopt the F-16, but assembly lines would be set up in Europe as well. The Air Force initially planned to purchase 650, not all at once of course, but ultimately, to complement, not replace, or kind of sideline the F-15. But they said, hey, we might buy as many as 1,400, because cost-wise it was relatively affordable. It used one engine, but it was the same Pratt & Whitney, or at least very similar to what was used in the F-15, which was good for logistics. Early on, there was a lot of concern about only having one engine, but General Dynamics felt it was tried and tested enough to be trusted. The plane was at this point a multi-role fighter. It was capable of... Air to air is a pure dogfighter. Also, air to surface, it could be a fighter bomber. It could even carry anti ship missiles. It was fly by wire, very computer driven, has a semi delta wing shape to it. The cockpit for its day and time was very advanced, it had no Really obstructions. It was a bubble canopy to give a better field of view. The uh, seat was reclined at 30 degrees for comfort at high speeds. Had a very unique control stick offset to the side, not in the center. And the initial control sticks weren't even, they didn't even give feedback, they didn't move. A little bit later, this would be corrected where we kind of have a, a false input to have some movement and feedback for the pilot. Very interesting cockpit. It was actually very advanced for its day and time, yet at the same time cost was kept down by using many systems that had already been tested on planes like the F-15. In Europe this did compete against Modern jets like the Seaprocot Jaguar and Dassault Mirage F1 and later 2000. And oftentimes the F16 would be selected. As I said originally, this model or this plane is a model of one that was in the Belgian Air Force. It is a Block 20. But later, it would be sold off as surplus to Jordan. Lots of history there and lots of data and many, many variations to boot. And like I said, it had the nickname. A Viper, which not only stuck, but has been used on some later company variations, even. The Viper was first shown off at the Paris Air Show in 1975, where it definitely impressed the Europeans, chief among them the Dutch and 
the Belgians, and a consortium of European countries would get together and uh, water about 350 and help establish production lines in the Netherlands and Belgium. And these would be up and running by the early 80s. Also in 1980, the Israeli Air Force, the IAF, would receive 79 of the new fighters from a canceled Iranian production order. Um, yeah, revolutions tend to do that. And they would really put the plane into its first true combat debut in April of 81. It would have its first aerial victory against a Soviet Mi-8 helicopter. And then in June, it would have its first major ground attack debut when Israel would use them along with F-15s for escort to successfully bomb an Iraqi nuclear reactor preventing Saddam Hussein from potentially gaining weapons grade refined uranium. From there it would only continue to have more and more success. It was tried out that year in Lossimaf, Scotland in a competition for attack bombers where it went up against General Dynamics older F-111 as well as the Jaguar which it had already kind of gone head to head with in the past and other ground attackers and it would be considered victorious and then in 1982 during the Lebanon war Israel again would use several is air-to-air -air fighters and shoot down Syrian MiGs. I believe it was credited with 40 some odd victories. So very impressive combat record early on. And of course at this time more and more US Air Force squadrons were coming online and the F-16 was heavily used during the 1991 Gulf War. In fact, it was credited with dropping around 25% of all ordnance onto the ground, as well as interdicting other fighters, and just was a, you know, staple by that point. It was in service for a decade and was a very mature machine and a very well uh, respected. You know, I think I might have grabbed the wrong model, but I can't put my finger on why. Hmm. Oh well, let's talk a bit about some variants of the Viper or Fighting Falcon, shall we? For those who know me, you know that uh, I have this thing for NASA, so when I heard that Hobby Master did this model of the F-16 in NASA delivery. This is from the Dryden Test Center. I was really interested and then when I realized it was an early Block 15, relatively early design anyway, I thought it'd be neat to have an early plane with NASA colors. Now this one has been updated. It's technically an AM so it has been modernized some. You can tell by the tail. But still it has a lot of early features. The initial blocks 1, 5, 10, there weren't a lot of differences. Just small tweaks in, to the design. And they were pretty much in production through the early 80s. The block 15 is said to be the first major revision and even it's not a huge difference for example they added two additional hard points the the chin ones for targeting pods they also did um, some basic body updates for example they went to larger stabilizers in the back 
they also updated some of the avionics. You can look it up. It means a whole host of changes. And they would deliver these through the 80s. Soon we would have the Block 20, though. This was more of a computer update. And like I said, this uh, Jordanian one we first looked at is a Block 20. Not that it's going to look much different on camera. At least not the way I video. <laughs> but um, had a lot of you know computer advancements. And uh, started to work with some guided missiles and some early versions of targeting pods, things of that nature. Again, you can look it up. Then in 1989, the Midlife Upgrade Program study began. Originally, the U.S. Air Force was involved, but then they kind of backed out. But uh, what would become Lockheed Martin would move forward with it in the first... Uh, upgraded plane prototype would fly in 95 and then um, the first kits would start to be installed in older A's and B's starting in 97. Originally they were going to do over 500 upgrade kits in the end they ended up doing around 300 350 but um, they would you know they would move on from there like I said this would be very popular in the first Gulf War. The, the F-16 would continue to see use throughout the 90s. It would enforce the no-fly zone over Iraq. It would also be used in peacekeeping missions in the former Yugoslavia, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Late in the decade it would be used over Croatia. Just kind of a, in, well, but it a good plane it was actually one of the cheapest planes in the Allied Air Force to fly, you know, by man hours. It's also easy to maintain, but at the same time, it still had very good performance. It was still a good dogfighter, and it was still very adaptable. It could carry just about any ordnance out there, and as they developed new models and blocks and continued to upgrade the avionics of computers, there was only even more and more of a success. To that end, it was still very much in frontline U.S. Air Force service in 2001 and 2003 after the War on Terror, as it was called, began. So it was used in Afghanistan and then again in Iraq beginning in March of 2003. And the U.S. Air Force who had originally bought 650 and thought they might buy 1400 received its final plane, final F-16, in 2005, and at that point it had nearly 2,250. So, um, yeah, I'd say it liked it. And the plane in general was very successful. Uh, worldwide they've made over 4,600 and counting. Uh, Lockheed Martin, which General Dynamics would be bought out by or fold into, continued to manufacture these in Texas through 2017 and then after fulfilling the last Iraqi, Iraqi, there we go, the last Iraqi contract closed up shop there. But no, it wasn't the end of production. They were just moving production to South Carolina so they could focus more on the F-35 Lightning but oh no the F-16 production actually just started back up this year so they are continued to service and update older blocks as well as offer new ones to customers in fact there are several modern versions even if the U.S. Air Force kind of quit buying with the ABs and early CDs, other Air Forces are still very much interested in the plane, like this model over here. So let's kind of wrap up with those. Alrighty, hitting the home stretch here. This is one of the most advanced. F-16 variants in the field. 
This is a block 52 plus. This is a D, a D model flown by the Polish Air Force. The second generation, the first being the, the A's and the B's, was really taken over as early as 1984, at least the initial prototypes that will become the F-16 C and D would fly in that year. They would start off with the Block 25, then they would move to the Block 30 slash 32. This is important because now we've pretty much been using different upgraded versions of the Pratt and Whitney engine to this point, but with the 3032 we have an option. The 30 uses a new General Electric engine, and the 32 uses an upgraded Pratt and Whitney. And then point is, as we started to add more and more capabilities to this plane, we added weight in bulk. They would move from that version to the 40, 42. And really what we're doing at this point is we're just improving the avionics, we're improving the night vision compatibility, we're improving the cockpit. For example, we're going from monochrome to color display in the cockpit there. Of course, we're improving weapons compatibility. For example, able to use shrikes. Later on, newer things like the JDAM. Also, we start to use GPS compatibility around 1991. You know, on and on. Again, you can look it up. I'm not going to try to bore you too much today. Enough's already enough. <laughs> The U.S. Air Force would receive some of these newer versions. They would start to fly them in 87, 88. But, um, yeah. A lot of times these planes were given as export. The last of kind of the original A, ABs were shipped in the mid-90s. And then after that we go pretty much straight to the C and D models. The 50... 52 Plus was a modern 21st century fighter. In fact, the first customer to, to order these was Greece, who started to field them in 2003. And they would have a full weapons suite compatibility. They would be fully GPS compliant. They would have new computer systems. They would have a new helmet they would have what are called conformal fuel tanks, which you can see on this model here. They're pretty neat. They're these things on each side of the wing that kind of square it off. This was done to add about 450 extra gallons, obviously to increase range. And um, if you really needed to, you could still use the underwing fuel tanks that we've seen on the other two models for really long range. Or, if you don't, you can use those larger hard points next to the fuselage for large weapons. And, of course, the wings would be strengthened to work with heavy ordnance. There's also the spine on the top. It's mostly, I think, a feature of the D's. Kind of the boxy spine. That's to store new... Avionics and sensors. Speaking of, we started to play with the lantern pod and sniper pod in the late 80s, early 90s, but by block 40, it was becoming standard, and by the 50, 52 plus, it was a common sight. And these targeting pods further increased the all weather capability as well as just, you know, pinpoint accuracy, so reducing collateral damage and making uh, weapons use more efficient. One thing about World War II bombs, they were relatively cheap but inaccurate. Newer weapons are very accurate and can be very powerful. They're also very expensive, so Air Forces don't like to waste them. I thought this was a neat model to pick up because it's one of the newest ones that Hobby Master offers. 
Poland, I've also always found, is an interesting nation as well. Both Jay and I have a kind of an interest in Poland. They were first interested in the F-16 as far back as 1997. They had a fleet of older MiG-21s, SU-22s, with their newest fighter being the MiG-29, which is no slouch, but they didn't have that many. They considered upgrading their MiGs, but in the end they decided to get a new fighter. They were first going to lease them. They looked at the Mirage 2000, 2000F, excuse me, 2005. They looked at the F-16, the F-18, some other things. They eventually went with the F-16, and then in 2002 they decided instead of leasing, they would just buy outright. So they worked a deal with Lockheed Martin to purchase a total of 48 Block 52s, 52 pluses to be exact. They were going to get three dozen C single seats and a dozen D two seaters. And uh, yeah, they would fly the first prototype for the Polish order in 19, excuse me, 2006. And they would deliver them from that year through 2008, 2009, depending on the source you read. It's a very successful order, and they're still flying them to this day. Lockheed Martin will continue to make newer versions, and one they made specifically for the Arab Emirates. Arab, excuse me, Emirates was the Block 6062. In fact, because they helped fund it, they actually have a stake and some licensing rights with that version. One of the newest ones is actually considered the F-16V, V for Viper. It was first shown in 2012, as known as the Block 70, 72, and it is specifically designed to either train or be compatible on the battlefield with 5th generation fighters, such as Lockheed's very own F-35, as well as European fighters like the Eurofighter and newer Dassaults, and even potentially some Russian planes like the Sukhoiev 35 and so on and so forth. So that's about the most up-to-date version I'm aware of, and I think it's just neat that they kind of finally gave in and uh, adopted the Viper name. When you hear a lot of Air Force pilots talk, they, they, they call it the Viper. That just seems to be a very popular name for the plane. And it does sound a little more aggressive and a little more unique than Fighting Falcon or just Falcon. The U.S. Air Force planned to retire the F-16 in 2025. However... Because of delays with the F-35A, the Falcon's retirement is uh, kind of postponed. A large number are still in active U.S. Air Force service, with several hundred more in storage being kept in flyable condition if needed. Still others are given away or sold or leased to American allies, so they're still very much a vital modern aircraft. And like I said, as of this year, a new production line has been set up in South Carolina, so Lockheed is taking orders for Block 60, 62 aircraft for the Arab Emirates, as well as 70 and other ones, and servicing and upgrading existing aircraft. To newer standards. The Iraqi Air Force is a relatively new customer, for example, and several former Comblock nations have been buying Western fighters, including the F-16. Like I said, they built over 4,600. It's the most numerous modern fighter in the world. It's being used by 25 nations. Not only has it been used by the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, 
While it never adopted it as a frontline combat fighter, it does have some that it uses as an adversarial trainer. So it is an American Navy service. And as you saw up another model, NASA has a few that it uses for test beds. For example, it's used kind of unmanned um, terrain avoidance testing, computerized systems. It's used it for some high altitude stuff, for some uh, short takeoff landing testing. They've even set up some canards on some F-16s and played around with that. So very interesting. Like I said, this is just an overview. I plan on doing a few more short but specific videos. For example, on the Israeli versions, there's one that Hobby Master makes that I'd like to pick up eventually. But I just had this Polish one come in from uh, Pete's Collectibles. It's a relatively new release. It's been out for a year or so from Hobby Master. I just think it's neat. I like the conformal fuel tanks. It comes with... Um, a few different armament options and pods you can install. And I didn't have a two-seater, so I thought this would be a good one. Since my other two are kind of older planes. But yeah, the F-16. I've done a video on the F-15. And several others, so it was only time to give the old Falcon a, a chance. It's a plane that I've not obviously flown, but I've sat in and handled. A family member did fly these during the first Gulf War, and of course they appear at air shows. And just a very successful plane. It kind of reminds me of a World War II plane in the concept that it wasn't meant to be cutting edge and the best of the best. It was just a good, solid fighter. Just, you know, it had the performance, but it didn't just break the budget. And it kind of shows that America doesn't have to do everything at an extreme price tag. So, yeah, this is probably something that will remain in an Air Force service in America and around the world for the foreseeable future all right guys appreciate you tuning in and sticking with me i know this has been a long one but i wanted to give the bird here it's just desserts and credit so hope you found it interesting if you did you might check out some of my other videos and uh, i will get around to the fa-18 and don't you worry i've already covered the f-14 and the f-15 so we're we're slowly working our way up and uh, we'll go from there. Any questions or comments? Or if you own an Eagle Moss model. Excuse me, Moss. <laughs> if you do, that's mine too. They have appeared in this video. But if you own a Hobby Master F-16, I'd love to hear which one you picked and why. But yeah. This is Misha. And I'll catch you very soon. Next time.